Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's lesson. We're going to look at Unit 7, Part 2. We're going to talk about resonance and waves today. So as you guys uh, completed your overview for the unit at the beginning of last week, you should have read across this concept of resonance. Resonance is simply an applied force that's already working on an art, um, a previously oscillating object in which the amplitude of that op oscillation then increases. So for example, if you're pushing someone on a, on a swing set, obviously they're swaying back and forth in a rhythmic motion. And then obviously the force that you're pushing with is applying to that already oscillating motion and then increasing the amplitude, which then makes the person go higher. Some of you like to jump off, and I know that that was something fun we used to do back in the day, but please don't try this at home and hurt yourself. Another way to do it is, uh, or another example, if you will, is jumping on a trampoline. As you jump on a trampoline, you essentially increase your amplitude by jumping higher and higher. Or you can have a heavier person jump and time your jumping perfectly so that it projects a smaller or a lighter person into the air. I know I used to do this with my family at home. My dad would bounce us super high. Um, but that's just an example of resonance in which you're applying a force to an oscillating object or something that's already moving periodically. And then that amplitude of your motion or of your wave, if you will, that we'll talk about later today, actually increases. So the small amounts of force applied at specific times increase the amplitude of that object or that oscillating object. So we can actually look at a real world example. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge was actually a bridge that collapsed. Ruh -ruh -ruh it collapsed because of resonance in an increase in amplitude of the waves that were traveling across the bridge. So if we take a look here, we can go to a short video to watch. at Tacoma Narrows in Washington State in the U.S. Now, there used to only be one of them, and it was actually either of the two. You can probably see the one on the left over there is slightly older. The one on the right is a bit over 10 years old. But the original bridge, it went very, very wrong. So when the original bridge was built, it wobbled a lot. It actually got a nickname, Galloping Dirty, and people would come from all around to go over the bridge. If you look at the footage I'm showing now, I personally think these people were probably crazy. The things got a whole lot worse in November of 1940 when the bridge really started to sway. Fortunately, this happened over a while and there was only one fatality and it was a three-legged dog owned by a man called Leonard Coatswell. <laughs> So what exactly happened to this dog that was stuck on this bridge while he was doing all these crazy motions? Well, the owner tried to rescue him, another man came out and tried to rescue him, and then an engineer who had come to observe the motion of the bridge, the bridge was swinging a lot. This guy went out there, tried to get the dog, but the dog was scared, snapped at him, and the guy eventually abandoned it, got off the bridge, and just moments later, the bridge fully collapsed and fell 200 feet into the sound below. And when I was planning this, this didn't look so high, it was kind of like, oh, you know, and in looking in the video, it, it, it looks smaller in a way, but that's a really, really long way down. And then the bridge fell, sank to 125 feet below the surface, where it remains there to this day as one of the world's largest artificial reefs. <laughs> just a case of bad engineering? Well, no. The engineering was actually pretty good, at least according to the science of the time. The reality was if we were building this bridge today, we'd have a much better understanding and we would not build it like this. Basically, the problem was the bridge was pretty strong, but you have this, uh, this flat surface on the side of the bridge. You can, you can sort of see it today where there's now holes, but that was just flat. The wind would buffer into this when it got too strong and it would create tiny little whirlwinds. And the problem is, this would cause small motion in the bridge, and each time it moves, the whirlwind would get slightly bigger and slightly bigger, and the motion would get stronger. This is something called aeroelastic flux. 
process. And now it's a fully understood engineering thing. And they built both of these bridges to not have that problem. You know what's particularly cool about this story? The engineer who arrived on the bridge, tried to save the dog, and escaped in just the last moment. He was the guy who actually built the new one. Uh, was an engineer behind him. And he built wind tunnels and scale models of the bridge to make sure that this problem wouldn't happen again. So after the bridge collapsed, it was about 10 years later they built another one. It's a lot of it's a lot of sound to cross, so they did need another one. But they didn't get built for 10 years because of shortages because of World War II. Now was going into building things like tanks, so less bridges being built. But they eventually built it, and then many years later, about 60 years later, it wasn't enough. The traffic was too much, so they built another one, which you also saw earlier. That was the second bridge, and now one handles eastbound traffic, one handles westbound traffic. And that's the story of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge and the bridge collapsed and it's only it's only victim, that poor three-legged dog. Well, I really hope you liked that video. If you did, please do. Oh, yes, that poor three-legged dog. Well, I hope you understand a little bit more about resonance. Um, that was a real-life example. Um, obviously, engineers take into account all of the issues with resonance when building their structures, and that was a very well-learned lesson for them. Okay, let's continue and let's talk about um, waves. So you guys learned probably a lot about this in middle school, but we're going to go through this pretty quickly. You just basically need to understand the properties of waves and you need to understand what types of waves move through specific mediums and then obviously what kind of uh, motion you can detect or uh, recognize within a diagram or an illustration of a wave. So obviously a wave is just a simple disturbance. It carries en energy through some sort of matter or space or what we're gonna call is a medium. So mechanical waves actually require a medium. Mechanical waves could be water, uh, I'm sorry, your medium through which mechanical waves can travel could be water, air, ropes, springs, basically solids, liquids, and gases are the mediums that your mechanical waves can travel through. So if you look here, this is just a simple illustration. The fact that we can see the illustration of the waves here, obviously this is just a ripple effect, that is an example of a mechanical wave. Moving forward, a wave pulse is actually the disturbance that you can see traveling through the wave or through the medium. If the wave moves up and down uh, at the same rate, that is an example of periodic motion. You're gonna need to understand how to draw and illustrate these types of waves for part of your homework today. So a transverse wave is a particular wave that vibrates perpendicular to the direction of the wave's motion. So if you look here, you can easily see this is your perpendicular motion, meaning that the wave is moving up and down while the whole motion of the wave is moving left to right. So those are perpendicular uh, vibrations or wave pulses there. As we look now at a longitudinal wave, imagine a slinky laying flat on the table. So this could be our slinky. And imagine you took your two fingers and you went ahead and you pinched a couple of the kinks or the rings in the slinky together. As you pinch that, and once you release, you're going to have a wave pulse that shoots out this way and a wave pulse that shoots out this way, kind of like that ripple effect. That is going to be called a longitudinal wave, meaning that the disturbance is moving parallel to the direction of the wave's motion, meaning that the pulse is going to be going out to the left, out to the right, versus up and down. So some examples here of longitudinal waves, um, the biggest example we're going to talk about later is a sound wave. So these uh, sound waves transmit their um, different amplitudes, wavelengths, all kinds of their properties through longitudinal wave-like properties. As we look here, this kind of sums up the difference. So transverse wave versus a longitudinal wave, obviously down here you have your transverse wave, so moving up and down, perpendicular, and you have your longitudinal wave here, so moving parallel to that direction of travel. Uh, you could use something like this as an example for part of your homework. You can refer back to this page because you will have to draw some illustrations here. If we keep moving forward, there is actually a type of wave that has characteristics of both transverse and longitudinal waves. This is called a surface wave. So obviously, we live in Florida. The beach is the best example of a surface wave. Um, that you could probably find. So you have the transverse wave motion on the waves of the beach, okay, or of the ocean. You can have the water moving up and down or 
perpendicular to the direction that the wave is moving. And you also have this cyclical disturbance of a rush of water is collecting here, okay, and then building, building as the crest of that wave or the amplitude increases. And then we have that release, and then we have another rush of water, building, building. And then these would be the disturbances that represent the longitudinal waves because they are also moving in the same direction of the wave's motion. So once again, a wave that has properties of transverse and longitudinal waves is called a surface wave. When we're measuring waves, there's many ways to actually measure them. We can talk about uh, the characteristics of a wave based off of how the wave is produced and what the medium is that it travels through. But we can also talk about simple things called the amplitude, the wavelength. We can talk about phase, period, and frequency. So let's just go ahead and talk about a sound wave for a, a quick second. And let's talk about the speed or the velocity. Your speed actually depends on the medium. This is super important as we move forward into sound after this part, which will be part three of unit seven. But if you look at these different mediums here, so we have solid, liquid, and gas. We talked previously about the differences in the particles. So in a gas, the particles are moving freely. In a solid, um, there's some forces holding them together. And then obviously in a liquid, the force is a little bit weaker and then they can move a little bit freely and also still be held together. Your sound travels differently through these different mediums because of these particles. Your sound waves then obviously bounce and stuff off the particles and, and kind of resonate through them. But obviously when there is a solid, your particles are closer together and then they push that sound through that medium at the fastest rate. We can also talk about specifics when measuring a wave. So this is where we're gonna get into some of our formulas and we need to make sure we're paying close attention. These bulleted items are very, very important. These are characteristics and properties of how a wave travels. So up here, we have wave A and wave B. Both of these obviously are examples of uh, transverse waves. They have the perpendicular motion, uh, and obviously our wave direction would be going to the right here. So some of the things, a crest is obviously um, the height at which your, your wave you know, raises from its equilibrium point. Right here, this would be the equilibrium point. Uh, so we'd have a wave pulse here, and this would be the crest. The amplitude is how far that wave moves from its equilibrium point. We can talk about the amplitude here, and then obviously it is symmetrical and mirrored down here. The trough then is obviously the point at which your wave reaches below that equilibrium position, while the crest is the point at, at which it reaches above it. And then wavelength is the length between two crests or two troughs. So if we look here, we have this variable lambda, that is for wavelength, um, and we have our amplitude there, um, but this variable lambda here is gonna be something we use here in a minute. A wave's amplitude depends on how the wave is generated, not necessarily the speed. So the amplitude and the speed are independent of each other. Waves with greater amplitudes transfer more energy, so you need to understand that. The larger the amplitude, the larger amount of energy the wave is carrying. The period of the wave, which we know is the time that it takes to complete one cycle, is equal to the period of the source. So whatever the wave is coming from, those periods of the source and the waves will match. Your frequency of the wave is the number of oscillations per second. So over here we have a formula for frequency. It is one divided by the period of that wave or of that source. Our unit for frequency is hertz. So you can see that here and add that to your formulas for this unit. And just so we are understanding, both the period and the frequency of the wave depend on the source. They do not depend on the speed or the medium. So keep those ideas independent of each other. As we move forward, we can also talk about measuring a wave. Specifically, we said lambda was for the wavelength or the distance between two crests or two troughs of the wave, or basically two disturbances if we were talking about longitudinal. So lambda is what we're gonna use for wavelength. Now notice, wavelength is a unit of length. So our units for lambda, we will measure in meters. Or we also know we can use that abbreviation there. So lambda can be measured two different ways, or wavelength can be measured two different ways. We can take the velocity and multiply by the period. 
which would be this option. We could also take the velocity and divide by the frequency, which is this option. And manipulating this second option, we can also get this formula here, that the velocity is simply just the frequency times the wavelength. As we continue through, I'm going to show you a quick example, and then we can wrap this up. So for our example here, we said the sound wave has a frequency of 192 hertz. It's traveling a length of 91.4 meters in a time frame of 0.271 seconds. So I went ahead and highlighted your formulas up here for you so we can refer back to those. And let's go ahead and work through a problem like this. So for part A, it says, what is the speed of the wave? Well, we know speed is simply velocity. We know that velocity up here is frequency times lambda, but all we have are the frequency. We don't have the, la the, the wavelength yet. Um, we don't have some of those items that we need. So we can also think back, and we're going to do this one. We also know velocity is simply distance over amount of time. And in this case, they gave us the distance that the wave traveled in the amount of time it traveled. So we could either use this first formula here, or we can use um, a previously known formula. We're going to go ahead with this previously known formula. So our velocity is simply 91.4 meters over the amount of time that it took, 0 0.271 seconds. And if you substitute those values into your calculator in three significant digits, you get an answer of 337 meters per second. And then obviously there should be a direction with that. Part B asks us to find what is the wavelength of the wave. Well, wavelength is simply lambda. So we have these two formulas up here. We have wavelength is velocity times the period, or we have wavelength is equal to velocity over frequency. Now we haven't solved for our period yet, so let's go ahead and use this guy. So we know our lambda, or our wavelength, is going to be equal to our velocity that we just calculated, 337 meters per second, all over our frequency. And they told us the frequency of our sound wave was 192 hertz. Now, we're going to have to just commit these formulas, I'm sorry, not formulas, commit these units to memory. So if we take the 337 and we divide by the 192, we simply get an answer of 1.76 meters. That would be your answer in three significant digits. So that is your wavelength. All right, and then part C says, what is the period of the wave? Well, we know period is equal to T. So we have one formula up there. So we can either manipulate this guy, lambda is equal to velocity times time, and we can solve for T. We could say that the period is equal to lambda over the velocity. Or we know that frequency is equal to 1 over the period, and we can manipulate this to say that period is equal to 1 over the frequency. Any option is fine. I'm going to go ahead and use this guy, and I'm going to say that the period of our wave is equal to 1 over our frequency of 192 hertz. So the period of our wave is equal to 0 0.00226, I'm sorry, 0, 0, 00521 seconds. Pay attention to your three significant digits there, and that would be the period of this wave. Keeping this in your notes, you can go ahead and move on to your homework that it goes along with this section. Our homework here is questions one through five. Go ahead and copy them into your notebook, or you can print them out um, off of the blank version of these notes that I posted and answer them correctly. Once you answer them and show all of your work, obviously three significant digits for your answers. You guys know the drill by now, full complete sentences for anything conceptual, and then there's a couple of uh, sketches and graph drawing that you have to do for this one. Go ahead and submit them to Teams and save those as your notes. Thank you for tuning in and completing all your work. I hope you have a productive day.